what a week this has been. I think this is a week where it would be more interesting to watch from another country than from being an American. And it's been really, um, last week I spoke about the events of the week before and looking at them through the lens of what we've been studying this summer, which is all of the elements of awakening, the seven factors of enlightenment as they're traditionally called. And this week, uh, just as many huge and difficult uh, things have happened this week uh, for us, the debates, our president becoming sick, uh, the air for some of us really too bad to go outside and exercise and do stuff, which brings on fears about climate change, as Jack was saying. And at the same time, while all of this is going on, in Asia, people are celebrating, in China, they're celebrating Golden Week, which comes around the harvest moon every year. And it's the biggest and brightest and most easy to see moon of the year and so it's celebrated in china with golden week uh, my friend in hong kong said they just finished what they call the mid-autumn festival of the harvest moon and um and this traditional celebration of the harvest moon it's understood in uh in those cultures to be that the moon's circle of fullness connects us all that we all, from wherever we are, we look at this moon, we see uh, the circle of fullness that connects families, blood families, spiritual families, families of friendship and legal families. And at that time, everybody looks at the moon and thinks of each other. Um, and it really, I remember um, a young friend of my brother's, <laughs> young said, when we had traveled somewhere and this friend came with us and said, is, is this the same moon that I see at home? Yes, we all see this same moon. And in the Buddhist tradition, this image of the full moon stands for enlightenment and awakening because it's understood that our true nature, the true nature that Jack was referring to, the true nature which turns out to be the nature of just indivisible aliveness and awareness of this, that our true nature is hidden, just as the moon gets hidden by the clouds, our true nature is hidden by all of our preoccupations and thinking and um, just our personalities, the way we've been conditioned to perceive everything, hides the vastness of this indivisible aliveness that is our true nature. And, that uh, when the clouds part and the moon is revealed, everything is illuminated. Everything, the joys and sorrows that Jack was referring to, both sides, all sides of reality are illuminated clearly. And I love this symbol because it's really what I've been thinking about so much um, during this time where people have gotten so polarized. I have a friend who's a really smart businessman, very well educated, who in, keeps sending me articles about how wearing masks doesn't help. Masks are, uh, um, it's been proven that wearing masks doesn't help. And when I say, you know, why I think masks are important. I'm told that I'm simply wrong. And when I say, well, maybe we could meet halfway and understand that there are some drawbacks to masks if you don't wash them every time. And if you aren't aware that maybe they're carrying virus. No, no, I'm wrong. He's right and I'm wrong. And this view, uh, <laughs> these kinds of fixed views, well, we saw them in huge and glaring, vivid light um, in the so-called presidential debates, which really turned into a bullying and shouting session to the enormous dismay and chagrin of probably 
most people who were watching, but certainly the young people who were watching. Um, Jack and I went to the frozen yogurt store where uh, our grandson, who's 16, works, and we went to get, after the debates, I think we needed, you know, a hot fudge sundae or something to sweeten, uh, <laughs> to sweeten life's experience in that moment. And he had just watched the debate. I think it was slow, you know, nobody was coming in for frozen yogurt because everybody was watching and he got a chance to watch. And just seeing that through a fresh, innocent young person's eyes who was saying, I love my country. I want to serve my country. But when I see this, you know, it's just so um, discouraging, discouraging for them. So this image of the full moon and being able to look at both sides, the sides that are dismaying, discouraging, and actually terrifying when we think of climate change. I don't know, it feels like being stalked by a dangerous creature or something. It's, it's scary. And yet being able to hold this with the reality of uh, this, this aliveness that we can connect with in any moment of our life when we're a little bit mindful about ourselves. This is what our meditation, our mindfulness practice is actually for, to help us develop this particular skill. And, you know, this skill of listening is so important. I mean, hearing to everybody who has hearing just happens automatically. But listening requires an effort. It's like um, the statue of the Tibetan yogi, Milarepa, who's always, he's always pictured like this, with his sort of leaning toward, and with his hand to the ear, listening, listening. And... It's important because we know, um, I don't know, I heard somewhere that 10 minutes after speaking, we forget, or 10 minutes after listening, uh, we forget about 50% of what we've heard. And then I guess a few hours later, we're only, most of us remembering 20% of what we heard. So relaxing and really listening to each other. Um, this is so important. And how do we listen to each other when we're so divided and so polarized in our points of view? Um, you know, for me, just very practically, what helps is trying to keep about half my attention on you and what you're saying, really listening attentively, and then half my attention on me and what's happening inside me as I listen to you and realizing that when I can do that during the moments when I have the strength of mindfulness and presence of mind and heart to actually do that, the separation between us disappears. And I'm not talking about some pathological boundaryless state where I don't know where you, know, you stop and I start. I just mean that sense of being um, separate and opposed to each other, it disappears. It's like the middle way that the Buddha talked about when we can hold opposites together at the same time and let them peacefully coexist in our minds and hearts. When we can do that, we do access a much wider, vaster experience of life, of reality. And then we see that our inner life and our outer life are beautiful as well as fraught and stressful. And for parents of young children trying to parent during the pandemic, pretty hellish a lot of the time. So this is really, um, this is really what we all need to be doing more of right now. And I, I think it's an act of compassion to listen in this way, to listen attentive to ourselves, to whoever is speaking. As Bell Hooks said, and I think I quoted her two weeks ago when I was talking about uh, Van Jones and his stories of uniting opposing sides. Um, she says, my anchor is love. And if that's our intention, to come from a place of kindness and love and be some sort of embodiment of compassion in this life, when that's our intention, we can listen. And maybe we, of course, we're not going to, I don't agree that masks are not important. You may not think they are. I think they are. They make me feel safer. 
And, um, but I can also say, I get it. You don't think it's important. We won't be hanging out <laughs> during the pandemic, at least um, not in person and not close to each other. I wrote that in the newsletter uh, this week, which some of you may have read, but I think most of the people here um, did not because many of you are here from, uh, from Jack's community. And I was talking about how easy it is to objectify and blame somebody who makes what is in our eyes a mistake or says something that in our eyes is wrong and how easy it is to fall into self-righteousness and a kind of knowing certainty, I'm right, you're wrong, and to forget how to keep an open mind and heart. And we're seeing this all over our culture, maybe all over the world, but we'll just speak from our culture, that this sense of balance, of nuance, and the skill of being able to hold different perspectives and respect them as different perspectives, that this skill seems to be being lost. And um, actually, Jack reminded me of a quote by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And he's known to school children in America, primarily as a poet uh, from the um, 18th century. Uh, but he also worked for racial justice and social change. He was a very prominent abolitionist, and he and many of his family members used their wealth and their power of position to work really hard for the anti-slavery cause. And he said, if we could read the secret history of our enemies, we would find in one life in each one's life, sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. So to keep each other's vulnerability in mind, to keep the tenderness of our humanity in mind, this is how we can begin to have that sense of community that extends past the threshold of our front door and the front doors of our friends. Listening builds community. It builds unity. And mindfulness is how we learn to hold conflicting feelings like love and hate in the same heart. Children, when they get angry at their parents, they say, I hate you. But later or before that, they were snuggling and loving them. Adults, um, well, I'll just speak for myself. I sometimes have those feelings. And with mindfulness, there can be a sense of humor. I could even say to Jack, I hate you right now, but there's humor in it. It isn't full of genuine hate because I know the truth of impermanence. I know that, and I can hold the fact that this is somebody I basically love, love, love in my heart. Um, so being able to hold the sadness, the sorrow, the joy, the celebration. Um, my dear cousin Maria got married on Friday. You know, this is joyful. This was so loving and joyful to be able to hold this in the same heart as watching our debates. Uh, this is skill that we learn from mindfulness how to mindfully hold mixed or opposing views in awareness simultaneously. And when we can do this, this is the middle way that the Buddha taught. When we can do this, we can also access the mind that isn't 100% sure, that doesn't actually know for certain, the don't know mind that my first teacher, the Korean Zen master, Desan Sanim, talked about. And when we can access the mind that allows for the possibility that we don't know, that mind is quieter. That mind is more still. That quality of awareness is more allowing of the different perspectives that we really need to be able to hold in some measure of respect, um, if not agreement in our hearts. And it's much easier than also to let go of the need um, to judge each other and to be right 
all of those things. And, um, you know, at the end of my, of the newsletter, I quoted um, that Joni Mitchell song that I really love called Both Sides Now, where she sings, I look at clouds, I look at life from both sides now, from win, from lose, you know, opposites from both sides now. And then she goes on to say, and still somehow, I don't know, and still somehow, I really don't know life at all. And that attitude is not an attitude of ignorance, but of openness of heart and mind, the openness of heart and mind that we cultivate here in our meditation. So thank you for your listening. And Jack. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Trudy. That's great. Yeah, what a wild time to be living and a wild time to be practicing and meditating. And yet, it's so important. And kind of following up what you were saying, Trudy, I think of my teacher, Ajahn Chah. I actually think of Ajahn Chah and Sansanim, the Korean don't know mind great master meeting as they did. We had, I brought them together at our center in Massachusetts, uh, Insight Meditation Society. And uh, Sansanim talked about don't know mind. And Ajahn Chai used to talk about it's uncertain, isn't it? And they talked about how they taught. And then they looked at each other and laughed and said, oh, same mind, same mind. And I think about Ajahn Chai because while he would say it's uncertain, often we'd ask him questions and try and figure these things out. And he would sit in the seat of wisdom and smile and say, it's uncertain, isn't it? You think, well, don't you have something better than that? But then one day there was a Western <coughs> woman who had come and ordained uh, as a nun for s several years in the monastery around Ajahn Chah. Um, and she became a favorite of people because she learned the language, the local Lao dialect, and she was really quite charming and very, very dedicated. And she got a lot of appreciation and support. And then she disappeared. And a year later, she came back and she had, uh, she had gotten, she'd become an evangelical Christian. She'd gotten turned um, toward Jesus as her savior. And she came back and she said, you know, I, I, I need to tell you that you're not really practicing right. Um, and you all need to turn yourself toward Jesus. And she was going around the village and talking to people and it quite upset some of the monks and nuns and the villagers around. We'd supported this woman. We thought she was devoted as a nun. And now she's trying to, you know, convert us all. And they marched over to see Ajahn Chah, a whole group of them. And of course, he knew what was going on with this woman. And they said, what do we do? What do we do? We're so upset. And he sat there and he smiled, listened to them, felt all their, you know, struggles. And after he listened, he said simply, maybe she's right. <laughs> and the humor of it and the open mindedness of it diffused all their struggles <laughs> and let them relax and say, all right, we are who we are. And in this mystery, and this is a time where the veils between the worlds have been lifted and the veils of separation are not really working anymore. We, with the pandemic and climate change and calls for justice, we more and more see we're in this together. And then when we meditate from this place of don't know mind, of the not clinging to things or not clinging to our view or what is supposed to be right, we start to realize that our heart is big enough, as Trudy says, to contain all of these opposites, to hold them all together. And that that is really our birthright. You, O oh nobly born, begin the Buddhist text, remember who you really are. You are consciousness itself. You are the sons and daughters of the awakened ones. You have a nobility and dignity and a capacity to see this world with a vast heart, compassion and understanding. So how do we practice? Here are some instructions from the great 
sage Atisha. Listen to each line because one could do a whole teaching based on every line. And there's about eight lines. Explore the nature of timeless awareness, line one. That is step out of all the attachment and confusion and trying to fix and hold on and so forth and become the loving awareness itself. Explore consciousness. Who are you really? Line two, don't be swayed by outer circumstances. I'll let it stand on its own when you take your seat. Don't be swayed by the changing outer circumstances. Consider all phenomena to be dreams. And this is wild because where is yesterday? Where is the week before? Where is 2019? Where is, you know, the turning of the millennia? Remember Y2K? It's all gone. This morning is gone. Yesterday is gone. Your childhood is gone. It's all back with the dinosaurs and the Egyptian empire. It's all disappeared. Life of troops out of nothing, says Rumi. It, it appears and then it vanishes. Consider all phenomena to appear as dreams. Next instruction, don't brood over the faults of others. <laughs> This is your basic relational instruction. It works in marriage, works in business, but it also works for yourself to not brood over your own faults. <laughs> Don't brood over the faults of others. Be grateful to everyone. Next line. And of course, in Tibet, where this teaching has been held, they're grateful for suffering. Grant that I have enough suffering that I awaken the true heart of compassion. Be grateful to everyone. Offer your gifts to the world. You're not here as a passive observer. You've been given this life. You've been given the assignment of this life to bring something beautiful into the world. At all times, simply rely on a joyful mind. Now there's a statement in the midst of all of this to be known for the joy that's in your heart in spite of it all. And we all know people like that who retain this good spirit in the midst of everything. At all times, simply rely on a joyful mind. And then the last instruction, don't expect a standing ovation. You're not doing it for how it looks or what people say. You do it actually because this is who you really are. This is what your heart most wants. And so when you sit in meditation, you come back to the vastness. You come back to this perspective of not blaming and judging. You come back to a place of trusting that the heart can hold it all. And as Nelson Mandela said, do not judge me by my successes. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. And this is our humanity. And when you sit as the Buddha that you are, you see the dance of human life. You rest in the mystery of it. And you don't make it so much about me and you and us and them and who's in and who's out and who's right and who's wrong. All of the things that Trudy was teaching us about. And instead there awakens in us a kind of tenderness. We see the vulnerability of every single human being, a tenderness toward everyone. The heart opens. Mary Oliver writes, and therefore I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular. And each body, a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. And when we quiet the mind and tend the heart, we can see with those eyes to see each body as a line of courage and something precious to the earth, our own and those around us. I think 
Let's see what time it is. I think of this story that I tell in the No Time Like the Present book of Jerry Flaxstead, who was a physician describing his initial revulsion to a patient named Frank, an angry and obese homeless man who had diabetes, was unbathed, had gangrene in his legs and open sores. And when he did not take his meds for his mental disorder, Frank would flail his arms and spew curses to all those around him. Frank was admitted repeatedly to the hospital and for Dr. Flaxstead, Frank was a patient who was hard to love. One day Frank was brought to Richmond Hospital with congestive heart failure. The diagnosis was serious. And Dr. Flaxstead tended him as best as he could. Then 20 members of the down home neighborhood church in whose homeless shelter Frank sometimes slept arrived. They brought flowers and homemade food, chanted and sang hymns to Frank, creating a chorus of care and communion. And when Dr. Flaxstead returned to Frank's room after tending to another patient on the ward, he saw that Frank was smiling, bathed in their love, and the doctor realized that he had never really seen Frank at all. We're so quick to judge one another, to have our ideas, to be certain. And when we quiet the mind and tend the heart, it becomes possible to wed all the disparate opposites of the world as truly spoke of, and to take our seat in the middle of them. And something beautiful gets born out of that. Our capacity to be generous even when others hoard. Our capacity to be loving even when there's hatred. Our capacity to trust even when there's fear around us. Our capacity to be respectful even when others are not. Presence and courage. And then we bring our care to the world in our own way. And so I end with a passage from our dear colleague and friend, Wes Scoop Nestor. He writes, vote, vote, vote. This is one of the things that you can do from an awakened heart. You can be the Buddha in the, in the election booth. You can be the one who encourages others to write speech and write action, to participate, but to participate out of the presence of love. Vote, 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 vote for the birds, the bugs, the reptiles, the rabbits, the trees, the grasses, the bison, the salmon, the whales, the elephants. Vote for the lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and for the fox who goes out on the town, oh, town, oh. Vote for Kermit the Frog and for Big Bird. Vote for Ganesha and Hanuman and for all the beings who live in our myths and poetry. Vote for peace and for the future. Vote for evolution and the best of humanity and all the possibilities it holds. And so we awaken in ourselves and then we get up from our meditation seat and tend the garden of the world. And as we do, we drop our ballot into the box <laughs> for a beautiful future. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Jack.